it's a it's a it's a curious one. It was described in um, an ancillary book to the science of yoga, which of course I can't think of the name of it at the moment. But they described it as being uh, a situation where it's kind of like a self reinforcing loop. You kill yourself, and that brings karma to you because because karma is action. The karmans are critters that love action, and they they. They like strong, dramatic action. They don't care if it's good, bad, uh, or not. It's, it, they just don't like the mediocre, indifferent kind of actions. But anyway, so you kill yourself and you get a bunch of karma with you. The next time you're born, you bring that bigger karmic burden back with you, which even uh, further weighs down your depressed state, which leads you into choosing a life in which you're going to kill yourself again anyway. And it goes on and on and on. And so the the discussion is about how... There are predictable traps that exist within the materium for the materium players, if we want to think of it in that metaphor. And so our materium handbook, which they, of course, forgot to give us when we showed up, should really state to us that players in the materium need to be aware that rules and conditions uh, apply across lives. And so like in, in other video games where you're given nine lives or whatever and you pop up and go after you've been blown up, here you experience the, the reverse of that effect in the sense that if you get blown up, you gotta carry along the bad score with you from the previous version of the game. Okay. And that I think is actual. I've actually met an individual, uh, once and then I was told about him performing a particular act and stating something and then killing himself. And I was aware that he had that particular understanding. And at the one little time, I, a little interaction with him, I thought, that was a weird way to think about karma. And he had thought that he had burned all of his karma in this life. And so to prevent further karma, would kill himself. And so wow. he did so, which is really dumb. Yeah. Yeah, wow. Okay. Well, I really enjoy this aspect of your interviews. I appreciate you taking time to um, go into detail and all that. Thank you very much. Sure. That's the real woo-woo. That doesn't hurt at all. I don't have to really think. That's uh, <laughs> I've been in it so long, it just rolls right up. <laughs> okay. Oh, and oh, one more thing, too. How sure. do you personally balance or center yourself between the mundane world and the more enlightened world that we've been discussing? I use uh, Ni Kung in yoga. And what was the first one? Ni Kung? Yeah, uh, Kung means Judging. work. Like, uh, Kung Fu is, uh, you know, in, is hard work. Ni Kung is internal work. Is so that like Qigong? A, um, uh, Ni Kung is like, uh, the, the really hardcore, um, truth that, from which the current wave of Qigong stuff is extracted. It's a soft, watered down version of what you go through. If you really went into Ni Kung and you went the whole route, you, you end up encountering the, uh, Wu Shu, the martial arts expressions of it, where these guys, for instance, you know, tie 100 pound weights to their testicles and walk around, that kind of thing. And, um, and so that's the far extreme of it. But there's a early balance level that is, uh, remarkable for keeping yourself strong as, as long as you remember to apply it. That's the real curse, of course, is I'm not a, I'm every bit a uh, creature of my environment, and so I oscillate as, as much as everybody else. The fact that as I oscillate back through the center each time I grab that opportunity to do my exercises is probably the only thing that keeps me even remotely sane. Okay, very good. That and pie. And I know and I've pie. got a good peach, sure. peach pie down there calling me, so we'll have to wrap it up fairly quick, I think. Okay, well, I'll let you go um, so that we can um, let other people ask the questions that they sure. need to. Thanks so much. Hey, Cliff, we've just got a couple more questions. Um, just in regards to um, the forecast, because we're talking about the metaphysical, about the caveman and other stuff like that, I mean, obviously the data wall is coming starting March 2012, so I would think a lot of your forecasts um, would probably halt you know, at the hard stop. So. Is there any so what about these the caveman any more information and all these other nice metaphysical stuff I don't know that that's a true assumption that they halt I'm thinking of it at this stage as the um, uh, telescope breaks down but the image of what you saw with the telescope way off in the distance does not necessarily the, while the image goes away the reality of it doesn't necessarily go away so I don't know that that is true that that uh, we run into a super hard stop. What I do know is is true is that the system that I've got now 
uh, and the infrastructure in which it operates runs into some kind of a wall that disrupts the system. It doesn't necessarily mean that the civilization is 100% disrupted or any of the other things are um, not still valid. So, so especially, actually, I, I'm encouraged to hold that view by the unexpected appearance of all of the immediacy data, simply because I think of it as a situation of where it sort of makes sense that if our telescope is going to be disrupted, and it's a complex one, that the breakdown would be complex itself, and the breakdown would occur as a component of the reality that had been forecast, but not necessarily in any way defining the limits of that reality, if that makes sense. So in other words, it's, it, it's as though our telescope is, is um, dissolving in our hands, but our hands are not necessarily affected. We just can't tell yet, while looking through the telescope, what the state of our hands is in a Heisenberg uh, uncertainty principle kind of a deal, right? And we won't know until we take our eye away from the telescope when it finally breaks, and look to see if our hands are there, if they're there or not. And so we're trapped in this uh, Schrodinger's cat kind of, you know, George Ure's goat kind of an issue. Is the goat there going to bleed at us or not? We just don't know until we actually look at it. So the assumption I, I don't know is valid. Uh, it, it could be, but I don't assume that it is. Make sense? It does, yes. Forum member Odison's question was, do you think some people have a better tuned subconscious lexicon or better access to their subconscious lexicon than others, enabling sure. them to create more accurate future-looking art like movies, books, music, etc.? Sure. I think there's uh, absolutely all kinds of evidence to that, and I think there's a common correlation to a lot of it, and it has to do with certain psychotropic drugs that influence the connection between the grapheme to phoneme um, uh, pathway within the mind. Okay, we, I'm also just find, we also find, as an aside, that there's a naturally occurring form of it that uh, afflicts people with what we currently call dyslexia. And if you get into individuals like that, I think they are certainly within a... That population is certainly a very high statistical correlation to just those sorts of expressions. That is future-looking, you know, uh, really cool art that, that presays the future, etc., Okay. So second last question, Cliff. Um, in with going back to the data gap, basically, um, your premise, what well, the George's yours premise was that um, it could be a, the hard stop could be due to the internet. Now, the internet has grown, I think, four hundred percent since two thousand to two thousand and nine. Um, so, if it was the internet, then the holes would be due to internet activity or people dropping off. So, but it looks like the internet's growing and more people are using the internet. So, how do you reconcile that? Well, there's actually very easy ways to reconcile it, and that is that the rates of Internet growth are not necessarily um, being reported as we understand them. In other words, there may be far more amounts of growth in the Internet relative to bit traffic being reported as a 400% uh, growth, and that bit traffic might actually be video, which consumes more uh, bits and bytes to transfer the same amount of information. And so in that sense, we haven't really grown. We've just converted the media over to a denser pack, so to speak. Uh, so that would reconcile that, that view, that the report, reporting of the uh, Internet statistics are inaccurate at our current level. However, I do not think that that is the case. I think that indeed the Internet has grown, and I can reconcile it to our data gap in a number of ways, either outright fascic, fascistic uh, censorship at a hard level, fascistic fast <laughs> censorship at a soft level, which I experience now in some areas uh, such as China and Australia and, and other ways, um, and or uh, physical disruption to the Internet in the form of shutdown due to global rev, which shows a real high level of probability of continuing and indeed will force them to, kind of, to drastically uh, alter the um, electronic communications at the powers that be level. They're going to have a hard question to answer here probably about the time of the the uh, uh, September equinox. And we'll see whether they continue to support the Internet and it's, it, it spawn the cell phone thereafter. Um, and then there's, the, of course, the other disruption potential is that something happens to me uh, or I make a decision not to do it uh, uh, or there is a total breakdown in our ability here due to uh, something, you know, like an earthquake and or space aliens come down and snatch my ass off to Mars. <laughs> so uh, so any of those account for it, as do other more cataclysmic uh, levels of understanding. We can 
because we're dealing in such a huge area of the unknown that occasionally is right and that it is occasionally correct at a level that exceeds chance, um, we make certain assumptions that I just don't know are valid, even 12 years on. Maybe we should have a dummy's guide to 101 theories on the data gap. But anyway, <laughs> that's all later. We w- I know. We wouldn't have time to bring it out. I was, you know, really good at work on doing a book and stuff, and it's like I've looked at the data, and there's just not enough time at this point. And if we, you know, if we pull our way from the telescope here in the year 2012 and my hands still exist, maybe I'll do the book then. <laughs> in closing, Cliff, we have one last question from Patrick, which we think all pie eaters really want to know. While we're waiting for the grunge of giants and baking pies, I'd like to know wh- what we could use instead of butter and or shortening to fold f- in for a delicate and flaky crust. Post Walmart days, I mean, pies are art after all, and it's all in the palette and presentation. Correct. And that's, uh, you can use oils. You can't use such a thing as an aromatic, uh, olive oil, for instance. But if you do use oil, uh, the reason that the hydrogenated, um, oils uh, or the solid oils like butter turn out so well is the way in which they bind to the ends of the little flour molecules with the water. And so this little electrical charge component that causes this three-way bind that creates flakiness is not usually found in oil crusts, and thus we see an attempt to leaven it in there by using, um, in oil crusts, you'll find frequently they use eggs or they'll use um, uh, leavening ingredients like um, baking soda uh, in, in, or uh, baking powder in small amounts. But you can achieve the same thing by slightly altering your process and at the end of the process of intermixing the oil with the flour, and you've really got to be good at it in a way you don't with the hydrogenated um, uh, uh, solid fats, I mean, you really got to get in there and grind that oil into the flour to the point where you're not talking pea-sized lumps. You're talking about a homogenous um, mass of little tiny uh, um, uh, bits of flour and oil molecules with the water, and then freeze it, and just freeze the, mix the water in, and don't touch the dough. Just wrap it all up and stick it in your freezer, and freeze it while you deal with the middle of the pie. Now, uh, I had to do that today, but it, I was doing it today because I'm dealing with a peach pie, and I like to let the dough rest while I'm dealing with the filling so that I can then go and work on the dough. And during the period of time that I take to work on the dough, the flour and sugars have started to work on the just sliced peaches to start that bonding process that is necessary for them to all set up before the flour gets hot. Uh, with some fruit like uh, peaches and nectarines and this kind of thing, Apricots, even both dried and fresh, when you mix the flour in to set them up as a pie filling, you want to give them time to bind to the flour before heat is applied. Otherwise, the ends of the flour get uh, cooked off before they've had a chance to bond to the proteins that are found in that fruit, unlike things like um, berry pies where one might use tapioca. Okay? Thank- yes, thanks again for your time, Cliff. A sure. few months ago... A few months ago, you replied to a forum member, Green Meadow, saying that perhaps many of us web bodders like you were not total strangers after all, and that in past lives, we may have been brothers and sisters fighting side by side against the powers that were. This reminded me of a quote by poet Samuel Johnson, great works are performed not by strength, but by perseverance. Your perseverance has helped many to continue to fight the good fight, and though the future is difficult to predict, thanks to your perseverance and ours, I think the final outcome is clear and inevitable. On behalf of Fox and all the members of the WebBot Forum, we thank you, sir. May you and your family have many pies to come. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thanks, Cliff. Hey, thanks, for, thanks for the opportunity, guys. It's, uh, it's uh, really a privilege and an, and an honor. And I've discovered to my horror I'm a man of honor because that puts all kinds of responsibility on you, including being um, uh, expressive of emotions when you find that you really should. And, and so uh, it's something my wife has always said, you've got to be more gracious and all of this kind of stuff. <clears throat> She's quite right, and I'm gradually maturing into that. And uh, yeah, I have a great deal of gratitude to all of you guys. Uh, I think you're absolute idiots, and we've got to get over this cult of personality, but I'm still truly grateful. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Cliff. Thanks. Talk to you guys later. Thank you, Bye. Cliff. Thanks, Bye. Thanks Bye. Cliff. Thank you, Cliff.